All right, so in this lesson, we're going to kind of solve this problem that I've offered up about this term not being equal to zero. All right, I'm going to explain why I think we can get rid of this term and just proceed with the Riemann normal coordinates, where that is literally true in a finite region around the origin. Okay, so let's begin. So we begin with the geodesic equation, right? And now, with this geodesic equation, we're going to take the third derivative of the geodesic equation. So I'm going to uh, take this, I'm going to take another lambda derivative of this thing. Okay, so the first step's pretty straightforward. We're just sort of using the product rule on this. And so we have this derivative with respect to lambda uh, of the connection. And then uh, because then we take uh, the second derivative of one of these two terms in the product rule, but because of all the symmetries involved, uh, it's just two times at once. So I just put a factor of two there. And uh, then this can be simplified a little bit. Uh, well, not simplified, but we know how to take uh, the derivative of this with respect to lambda. So let's execute that. And that in taking this derivative introduces this additional uh, vector um, dx dd lambda uh, by the chain rule, right? So this is, and so we end up with this term and this term. Now, considering this at the point p, right, in Riemann normal coordinates, or in, we understand that x alpha is a function of lambda, and that's supposed to be a geodesic. If it's a geodesic, it satisfies this expression. And that being the case, uh, uh, in our coordinate system that we've chosen, this normal coordinate system, we know that this term at p is zero, right? So this whole thing equals zero, right, in our normal coordinate system. And when that equals zero in our at the point P, we know that we can therefore eliminate uh, this term and this term, right? Because here's that second derivative again, which we just discovered was zero. Now that step invokes the fact that this guy is zero in Riemann normal coordinates, or zero in normal coordinates. I mean, well, it is zero in Riemann normal coordinates, but it's zero in any normal coordinates. Any coordinate system where the first derivative of the metric is equal to zero. The problem is these higher order terms. Now in Riemann normal coordinates, we can definitely say that x alpha of lambda equals equals um, lambda times these vectors v alpha, right? That's the definition of Riemann normal coordinates, right? That's how these things work. And if we go back to uh, the page that applied this definition and the paper, you know, here we see this expression laid right, right, right out. The coordinates are lambda times these vectors, right? And actually, back here, you can actually see the execution of this derivative that we just did, right? We just exercised this. So now we know that in, re in uh, normal coordinates, we're going to get this to go away. But in Riemann normal coordinates, where x equals lambda v, then dx d lambda equals v, dx squared d lambda squared, or d squared x d lambda squared, the second derivative, equals zero, right? And that's, of course, straight up there. And then all subsequent derivatives equal zero. So this equals zero, right? And that means that this expression here equals zero. And so going back to our page, you know, that's the same expression we just looked at. This goes away. Let me make sure it's definitely gone. And this equals zero. So that's pretty obvious and pretty clear. And we utilize this definition, right? Meaning it's not just dependent on the fact that we found a coordinate system where this equals zero, but we're taking a coordinate system where everything is tracked by geodesic distances. And that's what this tells us. So that's that extra step that allows us to set this term equal to zero. And now I think you can see where we're at, right? This 
this, and this. Those are all the same, which means we've automatically, this whole thing, I shouldn't do this, that's a mistake, but this thing here is symmetrized in D, B, and C, right? Because, uh, well, it just, it's, it's this object, although it's naturally symmetric in B and C, there's no symmetry with B and D and C and D, right? So it's, this is not normally, this is not obviously symmetric on B, C, and D. But once you, once you contract it with these three things that are identical, this object is in fact symmetric, which, okay, that's not a problem, but the fact is that it's symmetric but also equal to zero. That is what allows us to take the next step, right? So first of all, the next step we can write is this thing, we have zero equals, I can now, uh, uh, well, first I'll get rid of the minus sign, and if I write T A symmetrized B C D, if I do that, and I write those as V D, V B, and V C, right? I just simplify that to write these vectors. Well, that's still true, except this guy is, uh, if you follow the standard notation, that's one over three factorial, right? Times all of these, uh, uh, all of the permutations, right? But that one over three factorial, whatever it is, it gets eaten up by the zero, so that's gone. And the bottom line is this statement is always true at P, right? Always true in the center of the system. And if it's always true for any V, that means this must always be zero. And so I can now actually write this equals zero, right? And there you have it, right? That's my point, right? Once you invoke, once you invoke this, then this is actually equal to zero. Now, the next step is, what does that literally mean? Well, let's write it out. So this is the next obvious thing we would write down. Uh, now, remember, this is now I'm actually using the, the full symmetrization, right? When I symmetrize this and I write this down, I'm no longer really using the, the notation from the paper. This is the literally symmetrized form I intend to mean. But when I ended up with this, it's because all six terms, remember we get all six terms, they add up to, uh, because of the natural symmetry in the first two indices, right? there always ends up being a two in front of every one of these. But in this case, we've got this zero over here, so we divide by two. So um, now uh, I, can act, I can write this down. So this is not meant to be a substitute for this, literally, right? This is actually, I take the literal substitution for this, which ends up, remember, it's a one over three factorial times uh, six terms, which gets reduced to, 2 over 3 factorial times 3 terms, and then this gets divided into the 0, and these are the 3 terms left behind, right? So this is the actual sort of uh, um, standard notation. Okay, so let me erase that stuff. Oops. Let me erase this. And now, with this in place, we now have two things to work with. We have this and we have gamma a, b, c uh, equals zero, right? That's another thing that equals zero. So we have these two things that equal zero. All right, so how are we going to use those facts to get through this using, using those facts to our advantage? Because remember, they did not have access to the two facts. Let me actually rewrite the two facts down. Here they are. I put them up here, right? They've actually, this fact we've all we already used a lot. This is the fact that's available to us, but was not available to the authors of the paper. So that fact immediately implies a pretty big freaking disaster, right? Because this term goes away. Everywhere you see a symmetric derivative of the connection, you just erase it. You just erase it because it's zero at, it is zero at the center of the system. So that's all of this stuff. So somehow, We've got to get through the rest of the derivation of this paper without all of these terms that they've included 
and that we've already analyzed, right? We've actually gone through their stuff step by step. We've re-derived, we have re-derived this statement right down here. We've figured that out already. So we know that what they've done is good, but there is this fascinating problem that they didn't take advantage of this aspect of Riemann normal coordinates. So somehow the bottom line is when we get to right here at the bottom, right, we get here, what we're doing is we're cutting this off and we're examining just this. So somehow our examination of this has got to get us into the same place as their paper. So obviously our attention is going to fall on this term right here. And I'm going to write that as G E B D C with the line right there. That's how that's the notation we'll be using for this second partial derivative. Uh, first is with respect to D, second with respect to C. Not that it matters because it's symmetric in this and it's symmetric in that. It, I mean, it's symmetric in the first two indices and symmetric in the second two indices because partial derivatives uh, commute. So we have to study this thing. Now, clearly, that's the second derivative of the metric. So we know, we know that the Riemann well, tensor, we know that R, A, B, C, D is dependent on the second derivative of the metric. So given that, could it be that the second derivative of the metric is somehow dependent on the Riemann tensor? And if so, we have a way of substituting for this. The problem is, is it's pretty evident that that substitution is not going to be this, because if this term is not zero, that's when we get this. So we're going to have some other substitution here. But that other substitution we're going to discover, I claim, will be inequivalent, uh, but it will still work out. I guess I should say, in a sense, it, it is equivalent. Hmm. All I can say is the substitution we're going to finally accomplish will get us to the same place. But um, I feel the need to demonstrate that. So we will begin. So I just wrote down right here in this upper corner, that's the what we're looking for. We're looking for G, E, B, D, C. And I, I say that because we got to keep track of these indices, right? The, um, uh, uh, the indices... We're, we're trying to duplicate this paper, right? So I'm going to duplicate this object, G, E, B, D, C. So that's our goal. Our goal is to duplicate that object. So I have that up here. That's where we're trying to find. We're trying to find an expression that says G, E, B, D, C equals, and then there's some function of the Riemann tensor, you know, um, uh, a, B, C, D, right? Some some collection of indices. Actually, well, I'm, if I'm going to say that, I guess it's it's the Riemann tensor. There's going to be a bunch of Riemann tensor over here. I don't know a good way to to notate what I want to notate without coming into some indices problems. But there's going to be a bunch of Riemann tensors, a bunch of R's over here, and that's what we're after. So let's see if we can get there. So. I've written these things down in uh, with the, with the indices a, b, c, d, right? So this is our we've demonstrated that earlier in this very lecture, right? This is the new fact that we're using. Then we have an old fact, right? The definition of the Riemann curvature tensor, which is always as given as a one three tensor from its basic derivation, right? So the the the, uh, the derivation of that gives us this formula right here. Now, right away, we can get rid of these parts because we are using the fact that uh, the metric A, B, C equals zero in Riemann normal, in, not only in Riemann normal coordinates, but any kind of normal coordinates, right? Any coordinates where the derivative, the first derivative of the metric is zero. So those things go away. So we're left with this expression. So I've essentially rewritten that expression with different indices right here, because we want to go with A, B, C, and D. Um, I'm only doing that because the paper did it, right? Uh, I prefer mu, nu, alpha, beta. I like the Greek letters, but they use these nice little Roman letters. So we've got that to work with. And then we've got this to work with also. That is just the definition of the metric connection. And it comes from the classic definition of the metric connection right here. 
So I've just um, rewritten it uh, in this notation, right? So these are the three facts that we are going to work with. So let me get rid of the superfluous stuff here. All right, go on. So now we will start with this fact. What are we going to use from this? We're going to use this fact to derive an expression for the connection in terms of the Riemann tensor. Right now we have sort of the Riemann tensor in terms of some combination of the connection. We want to do it the other way around. We want to invert this expression. And I've done that right here, right? So we take our expression. This is the exact expression from the other screen, R, A, B, C, D, and uh, gamma, A, B, D, C, minus gamma, A, B, C, D. Notice how I'm, I'm compressing the notation, right? Usually I like to write gamma, A, B, D, C, with a gap right there. Um, most books don't. I've noticed the more and more I pay attention to this, the more I realize that most books don't. So just for fun, um, I'm getting rid of it in this case. Just make sure you know that when you lower A, our convention is to put A down below in front of the C, not after the D. Some conventions go after the D. Some conventions go in front of the C. If you have the space, of course, you know exactly where it goes. It fills the gap. Okay, anyhow. So I write this expression down, and then I write it again. But I'm writing it again with C and B flopped, right? I'm writing it again with C and B flopped. So this is just a literal statement. These, this is, there's no new content here. I'm just rewriting the Riemann tensor uh, with a different ordering of indices. And then if I take these two and I add them together, right? If I add them together, what do I find? Well, this and this are the same because, because uh, the connection is symmetric in the in the two first first two lower indices. Well, this derivative, the connection, the connection A B C is always symmetric in the lower indices. So the first derivative of the connection is symmetric in the first two of the lower indices, right? So because it's symmetric, this and this are equal, so you get it doubles up. And then these two just add together. So you get this. So with that in mind, you look at this. And, um, and what I want to do is I want to flip these indices, the C and D, to D, C, B. So I have instead of, so this is the literal sum you get from adding these together. Then you rearrange, you, you uh, take the symmetric combination, well, you rearrange C and D to be D and C, which you can do because of this symmetry. Um, and then you look, you have A, B, D, C, A, C, D, B. And you realize that if we use our second principle, which is this guy, right, we can take those two and write them as a single one, right? We're, using, we're basically using our new discovery um, about the, uh, uh, I guess what we say is the symmetric combination of the, 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 the symmetrized derivative of the connection is zero, right? The lower indices symmetrized derivative. So I take these two and I replace it with minus CBD. And you can kind of see these it should be a bunch of cyclic indices, right? So I should be able to say C B D plus uh, B D C, which is moving it, shifting everything over cyclically, plus uh, D C B, right? D C B, those equal zero. So anyway, so I'm using that feature to get this. So this three terms drops down to two terms. But look, the term it drops down to, CBD and BCD, those are the same for the same reason. We are symmetric in these first two indices. So that and that can be flopped, and you end up with minus 3 gamma ABCD. So that means the sum of these two Riemann tensors equals minus 3 alpha BCD. Maybe I should write that down. There, I wrote it down. So that 
big move, right? And then I just, uh, um, what did I do here? I, I, I guess I rewrote it as in minus one third, right? So you've got this sum is minus one third. Oh, and then I lowered the index. So we have it in terms of the completely covariant Riemann tensor instead of the mixed Riemann tensor. And now you have this uh, derivative of the uh, Christoffel symbol of the, I think this one's the first kind. I think this is the second kind and this is the first kind. Okay, so big step. So we've got this expression and this expression actually is the one we're gonna lean on. All right, yes, I did get, I just checked. This is the first kind and this is the second kind. Huh. Which is funny because when you when I was deriving this and I was learning about this, uh, the derivation actually gives you this the 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 derivation um, of of how a connection is supposed to work, at least the elementary derivation that I learned f first as a student, gave me the second kind. But um, anyway, so let's put this on the shelf. Put this on the shelf. Um, uh, I keep boxing the wrong things, right? Let me. Let me get this straight. Um, this is the one we're going to lean on, right? So uh, put that on the shelf, and now let's proceed to the next part, where we are now going to study this first kind Christoffel symbol. And this is the expression for the first kind Christoffel symbol using two different notations, right? This is your standard partial derivative notation, and this is the comma notation. And of course, our notation is just the comma notation, but we replace the comma with lines, right? So I rewrote this expression here with ABC, just to sort of jive with the paper a little bit using Roman letters. So we, get, we have this expression, and that's just the definition of the metric connection, right? So understand, this, this part is not based on some principle of Riemann normal coordinates, uh, or anything like that. This is just the definition of the metric connection, straight up. So now I, uh, since we're actually interested in the derivative of the uh, Christoffel symbol of the first kind, why are we interested in that? Well, it goes back to this, right? We're going to be working with this formula, and that formula has the derivative of the metric connection. A lot of this, this is all just algebra, first of all. Let me make emphasize, this is all just using these relationships here, and known other relationships like the metric connection just to turn things into a form that's very telling. Just pure algebra. But uh, so we're going to ultimately want to make a substitution for that, right? Because we want, we want the met, remember, we want the metric, we want the metric on this side and the Riemann tensor on that side. So we've got something that looks like a Riemann tensor. We know we have the metric connection which means we know how to write the connection in terms of the metric. So if I make this substitution, I should end up with a bunch of metric and metric derivatives over here. Actually, it'll just be metric derivatives, you'll see. And over here, um, the Riemann tensor. So that's getting towards where we want. So that's why we're doing this. So here we are, we take the derivative, right? We take the, uh, the derivative with respect to D. Now notice the metric connection, the, the metric connection here, it depends on the first derivatives of the metric. Now, in Riemann normal coordinates, or any normal coordinates, all of these are zero, and therefore this is zero, right? But the second derivative, right, the derivative with respect to d, that's not the case, right? That we don't know. We don't know what those values are. They're not zero, right? Just because the first derivative is zero at a point doesn't mean the second derivative is. So this is not zero. So I write this out, uh, just taking d. So d ends up on the second index to the right of our little bar. And uh, so that's the ex next expression we work with. And um, again, remembering that the metric is symmetric in a and b, or it's, I should say it's symmetric in the first two indices. So the metric is symmetric in the first two indices and symmetric in the last two indices. It's symmetric in these two because the partial derivatives, uh, the order of partial derivatives is, is partial derivatives commute. Or the order of partial differentiation can be interchanged, I guess is probably the smarter way to say that. So I'm going to switch those out. I'm going to switch A and B and A and C out. And I will now calculate 
this expression. This, this, it's the same as this, but I've only just swapped. Um, uh, well, I, I'm calculating it again with uh, uh, A, B, and C uh, uh, cyclically permuted by one shift, right? So I've shifted B to A, C to B, A to C, right? So A goes to C, B goes to A, C goes to B, and that's what this is. So this is just a restatement of the formula with a different index ordering, right? And, but what's beautiful is I'm going to now add these two together. That's sort of what I mean here, right? I've got that line. I'm going to add these two together. So on the left side of the equal sign, I get this plus this, which is ABC derivative D, BCA derivative D. But when I add all this together, uh, now the cyclic, now the, uh, the symmetry on the first two indices matters because if I swap B with A, then this term and that term are the same. If I swap, well, this term and that term are the same straight out, right? So this cancels with that because you have a negative sign in front of one. And in this case, in the remaining case, A and C, when I, uh, though this is symmetric in A and C, so I can swap those and then those two will cancel. So those two go away. So I'm left with, two times GAB derivative CD, and that two cancels with the one half, and I'm left with this expression right here. GAB CD is the sum of these two first derivatives of the uh, Christoffel symbol of the first kind, or the connection. So that's right, so the second derivative of the metric is the sum of two first derivatives of the connection, okay? So that's pretty good. So now, what's our next step? Well, I go back to what we put on the shelf before. We put this on the shelf, where we have the same first derivative of the connection is a sum of two Riemann tensors, or two, well, is a sum of these two forms of the Riemann tensor. I don't know how to say that. I mean, what do I mean? What, how, how do I say... It's the sum of the, re it's, it's in terms of the Riemann tensor, that's for sure. But what I want to say is that it's in terms of two different orderings of the Riemann tensor. So ABCD is ABCD plus ACBD. Hmm. I'm not quite sure uh, how, how, what kind of language to use there. But the point is we're now going to go onto this thing that we calculate. I just repeated that right here. So now we're going to use this and this and combine those things, which is pretty obvious, right? I'm just going to take this expression and substitute it for ABCD right away. So I get ABCD, ACBD, which is a literal substitution of this expression here. Then for this expression, I just need to reorder the indices of this formula. And when I do that, I get BCAD and BA. CD, right? Uh, so I get that. So I have to add these four terms together just to get G, A, B, C, D. But of course, you can probably see this coming. The symmetries of the Riemann tensor itself are going to cause some simplification. And the Riemann tensor, if you remember the symmetries of the Riemann tensor, it kind of goes like this. A, B, C, D, okay? It is anti-symmetric in A and B, and it's anti-symmetric in C and D. But what's interesting is that it is completely symmetric in the swapping of A and B and C and D. So this equals R, C, D, A, B, right? That's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to indicate here by the brown uh, coloration. But anyway, the point is it's anti-symmetric if you swap the first two indices and anti-symmetric if you swap the second. And if you make a swap of the first and a swap of the second, then it's back to being symmetric, right? Anyway, the point is, is I can take, I can take a, uh, this BA and turn it into AB in favor of a minus sign. So I can do AB minus, right? And then if that's the case, you'll see that this, R, A, B, C, D, and R, A, B, C, D, those cancel, right? 
So that means this will cancel with that. I guess I should do this, it will cancel with that. And I'm left with, ta-da, the final formula. Um, G, A, B, C, D is minus one-third R, A, C, B, D plus R, B, C, A, D. So that's the final form. Then, remember what we were after? Uh, we were after, ultimately, G, E, B, D, C, right? And that came from right here. This is what we want. That's what we're focusing in on. I want to be able to substitute for that. So I just need to take the expression we just derived and just put it in the form of the E, B, D, C. I just have to substitute these different indices. I shouldn't say substitute. I just have to write it in that form. So swapping A for E, B for B, B doesn't change evidently, C for D and D for C, I end up with this expression, right? And that expression is our gold. Because now, instead of at this point taking this whole thing and swapping out for two-thirds RECDB, I'm now going to I am now going to remember all oh, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone, that's gone. I'm now gonna take this guy and swap it out for minus one third. Uh, what is it exactly? E D B C, right? And then you swap the B and the E. E D B C R, oops. R E D B C plus R B D E C. So my substitution is not this, it's this, right? So somehow, even though, even though I have a minus one third instead of a positive two thirds and I have the sum of two objects instead of one nice little object, this substitution has somehow ultimately got to get us to the same place as this one does. So the point now is that we have gone through really, I think, the hardest part of the proof, right? We've discovered an expression for GIJ, and that expression for GIJ is written in terms of, of um, the, the metric on the... On, uh, the total space, right, and the Riemann tensor, right, this Riemann tensor here. And in fact, let me go to the real actual paper. So we discovered this, we got to this line here, the, 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 the author's work in the last few lectures, right, that was fun. And then in this lecture, we're, we've learned to replace this part here, we're going to replace this with the stuff we just derived today. And so now we have these basically two versions of this work floating around. Now, this is like a big sin for textbook lessons, right? I mean, for, for studying material, doing things two different ways in parallel with multiple notations. I mean, it's crazy. Although we are kind of in one notation, I have sort of adopted what I consider to be sort of erroneous notation for this symbol. Remember, this they call this the anti-commutator, but I'm... I'm arguing that that's really a, a bit of a stretch on the idea of the anti-commutator. But regardless, we're going to tr do this in both parallel tracks just to make sure that our notion of Riemann normal coordinates, which is worth understanding, actually does uh, get us to the same place. And uh, you could argue, well, well, if you're in a really convenient coordinate system like Riemann normal coordinates, heck, shouldn't things be easier? I mean, it looks like you've made things harder. It looks like their system is actually easier. They have one Riemann tensor there, and they don't have a negative sign and a six, although I guess that is neither here nor there, but that certainly looks easier than that. And that's fair enough. I mean, that's a good point. It's for all of the convenience of the Riemann normal coordinate system, the endpoint here looks harder. I will argue, however, that look at all the stuff we would not have had to deal with, right? Think about how much cleaner this process would have been without that. So Riemann normal coordinates, true Riemann normal coordinates, does clean a lot of that stuff up. And what's interesting is when you get here to the end, right, where all you're staring down is, is at this, the substitution we made 
right? The substitution we made uh, base, oops, that gives us this guy is actually a very well-known feature of Riemann normal coordinates. It is well known that in Riemann normal coordinates, uh, uh, G, E, G, E, B, D, C, G, E, B, D, C is going to equal minus one third R, E, D, B, C plus R, B, D, E, C. So given that that's relatively uh, well known, that then that just implies that we could have gotten in knowing our Riemann normal coordinates well, we could have gotten from here a little bit quicker. But again, that's a bit like saying anything that's been done before is easy. So look, this is all sort of subjective. Um, but uh, what isn't subjective is the fact that the coordinate systems that they used in their derivation was not Riemann normal coordinates. Their coordinate system was something something like uh, at this at, at the point P, they their coordinate lines are going through in such a way that at that point, all of the metric first derivatives are zero. But once you leave that point, the, the coordinate lines diverge from what would be the geodesic lines through that point, right? Whereas in Riemann normal coordinates, the geodesic lines and the coordinate lines are the same. And uh, through the point P, of course, GABC equals zero. Anyway, um, so that's the difference between their work and uh, the work we did here today. So our next step will be to proceed through the proof. We're going to work on the rest of the proof. Most of the rest of the proof doesn't really depend on this. We're not going to see this formula surface again until we kind of go through this large process of uh, understanding some unique coordinate systems that are make the problem a lot more intelligible. And um, once we do that, uh, we'll end up returning to this question uh, at this point. And at this point, we will, whoop, I guess at this point, uh, at, and at that point, we'll resubstitute our version as well. And we'll kind of do this in two parallel tracks, one with uh, their notation, one with ours. And ultimately, when we get to this spot here, I don't think I have it again. Yeah, ultimately, when we get through this stuff right down here, we're going to see that at this point, everything converges. The two tracks are going to converge on this equation right here. Okay. All right. So we'll continue down this path in our next